the class. Today we'll be in Ephesians 5.2, moving at lightning speed. Uh, divine love. I, I think we pretty much started this last class, but uh, kind of a continuation. I just can't do two titles in one sermon usually, so we're in divine love still. I guess I could technically, but I just don't. Um, before we get started, um, we know that we are uh, commanded to be filled with the Spirit and walk with the Spirit, so therefore we know what throws us out of whack on that, and that's sin. And so uh, we just need to get in tune, get back in fellowship, and stay uh, right with God the Father, and we do that by that relational aspect of confession of sin. So let's take care of that now. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are grateful and so thankful to be here. Uh, you, we know that each day is a gift from you. It's grace. It's uh, what you do for us to allow us to continue in your plan to grow spiritually, to continue to uh, use your spiritual resources just to enjoy life, to glorify you. And we're just so happy that we have it available to us. We thank you for everything that you do and thank you for this message in your word. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So divine love, it's, a, it's really a big topic. Um, I don't necessarily think we can cover it all here, but um, I think we can cover enough of it to get our, our feet wet anyways. So uh, if you remember just very quickly, that's where we're at in the book, uh, walking in love. Uh, so whenever you're walking around the church, you should just be picturing little hearts floating around you and uh, everything good to go, right? No, uh, it's a little about three quarters into the book, and it's not really a long book, six chapters, but uh, we're in the conduct of the church, so it's definitely applicable to us as believers is love. And it's really a huge, I think, part of the Christian life as we advance as we the maturing process happens, we have to take on this love or we're essentially not growing. And that's the thing that I have to ask myself when I get stagnant sometimes or if I'm not, I don't think maybe I'm growing as I should. And we all get to those places. Sometimes things happen or things slow us down. You know, the motivation isn't where it was uh, yesterday uh, or last week. And I think love helps you get through those things because it's a love for God that motivates you to keep going, to push forward, to, to you know, to, to glorify and to serve him because of that passion you have for him. And not only that, because it's a love you have for everything that he's done for you. Everything's already in place. We're just kind of opening our eyes to all these things that are just beyond our expectations, but they're there and he provides them. So, um, so that's what we got into a little bit of last time. And, and that's just grace. That's God's grace showing us what we have available. And so before we get into some of the highlights, remember this is a divine love, that agape love that God gives us. Uh, I wanted to mention that this is a thinking process. I know I kind of say that sometimes as we study that love kind of gets is one of those uh, qualities that gets pushed out into the physical many times by the world. And this for us, the Christian, and it is a thinking process in the world, too, but it, it you know how it seems to be more on the physical end. The looks, the feeling, the smell, the, everything that's involved in a relational aspect. This is referring to a love relationship in your mind. That's first and foremost that we have to know because that's what we think with. We think with truth and that's that relationship that we have, that day-to-day -day thought process 
in your, in your thoughts, that truth that you have. And that, that's that love relationship, constantly thinking about the one you desire to serve. And so uh, you may not associate um, sometimes with individuals or uh, whatever the case may be, but that's a physical thing. You know, whatever happens between people, there may be an issue there. There may cause a separation. The issue is how do you think about them when they come into your mind? That's what we have to ask ourselves. We may separate. We may do certain things. We may never see them again. And that's fine. But this is showing us that we've got to think differently when they come into our mind. Because love takes that thought in a different direction than versus reacting to something that we're, you know, may have offended us at one time. So, um, you know, if they pop into your mind and you, you can imagine them spinning on a piece of wood and you're throwing knives at them, that's probably not the right perspective of this love that we're talking about. Um, uh, I don't know why that came into my mind, but <laughs> that's a relationship that needs to probably need to work on the love aspect in in your relationship with God. And that's always the issue, I think, because remember, love has the unique benefit of absorbing faults, of absorbing failures, of absorbing things that have offended you, and it just dissolves them. And that's why it's so awesome, the, the love that we, we can have between believers, because it's not about the faults. It's not about the failures. It's not about what we do wrong or do right or any of that stuff. It's rooted in God. It's rooted in Jesus Christ at the cross. And that's why it's so amazing because it doesn't depend on anyone here. And that's encouraging to me because it never fails. It's always in place. It does fail, but only because we allow it to fail, right? So, uh, so a few highlights, and some of these are, are kind of new, are weaved, interweaved in here that we mentioned, uh, is God's love is always first. Um, and we know that he loved us first. And and all this means to us is that because he loved us first, that we must love him as our first priority so that we can have this divine love in place in relationships around us. See, the he set the precedent. The love came first to us. Now your love comes first to the world. See, but we have to keep his love first in our as our priority or we can't do that. We can't make it. Um, Number one, we can't have it on top of our list and it won't be there unless he his love is our priority. That that's that relationship. And that's one of the powerful solutions, I think, of this love, because remember, love can stop problems dead in their tracks. So uh, and part of this, we looked at a verse that said, God um, his word, if it, his God is abiding in us. That's the key. And remember, that was to stay or to remain. That's consistency is all that's telling me. You have the consistency. The matter is, is it staying with you? Are you getting distraction after distraction? Um, that could be another part of this, right? Because you have the consistency. I'm, I'm, I'm confident of that. Everyone here is consistent. I've seen you. I know, you know, I at least see you once a once a Sunday, but I know that you you wouldn't show up and you wouldn't be paying attention as much as you do if you were only doing it once a Sunday. There's more happening here, and I pray that it's an everyday thing occurrence for you. But um, that's the staying and the remaining. There's a fellowship involved. There's a taking in the word involved, and there's a life walk involved. All these things come together in the spiritual life. We don't just take it in. We don't just stop right there, right? We, we, we want to remain. And that remaining in God, remaining in us is his word is not only circulating in your thought process, but it's shown in your life. This is a lifestyle. You know, you have changed. Every one of you changed for the better. It's a lifestyle. You've, you've changed your entire life. You may not know it, but you've changed your entire life to revolve around God's word. 
different decisions that you made, whether it be diet, whether it be friendships, whether it be lifestyle in general, you have made different decisions that change because of the Word of God. And that's part of that love relationship, I think, to adjust, not just to come to a middle ground, to submit to God. This isn't a human that, we lo that we're talking, speaking about love here. This is God. You know, when it comes to people, there's a sacrificial aspect as well. When it comes to God, we follow his word and we want to be obedient. And I think that's the key when it comes to love. We've got to want to, we've got to, want to have that drive to learn, to have the drive to listen to have the drive to get better at what he has for us because it's so important if you know if we fall off of these uh, things that the commands that he wants us to do we've, we're essentially uh, falling out of his word and, and out of love you could say so and you should automatically correlate this this abiding in you to you could say God in general, but we could also say his word. Remember, these two things go hand in hand. These aren't just the physical words on the, on the pages of Scripture. These are things that we take from the Scripture and we're allowed to live and think with them. This is the thing that changes lives. We always hear that the only thing that's going to change is the word of God, salvation or influence spiritual life as you have. That is really it. I mean, we've got to have this consistency when it comes to the abiding aspect. Remember, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. That's for darn sure. Or from something, you know, uh, it must come from the knowledge of his word. That, that's where the basis of what you have and I have available is from the knowledge of what you're learning. Um, and not just the academic knowledge. Remember, you know all about that. It takes the Holy Spirit's intervention on our behalf. It takes the Holy Spirit to, uh, to be influencing us to not only teach us, but what else? The Holy Spirit does so many things to live it out. Well, I mean, we can't do anything on, on our own. We can't learn. We can't live. We can't walk in the spiritual life unless it's by the Spirit. So we're, we're here, but don't ever forget it. It's not meant to be done on your own. This is way too hard to live a life on your own. You've seen the, the results of that. So, um, and then 1 Corinthians 2.14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So... That's a good verse to remind you that this isn't just an academic exercise that we go through. This isn't just how much information we can go gather and regurgitate it. This is a spiritual process that's an internalized process that takes what the, the words, the, the, the teaching, and the Holy Spirit makes those and where you can actually think and live and make decisions based on them. There's a big difference there than just you know, kind of dormant knowledge that we know and we can talk about. That's a good thing. But what are we going to do with that? It, we've got to make it wisdom. It has to, there has to be a transferring process. And remember that takes two things. It takes the Holy Spirit and it takes your positive volition. There's an aspect of, of positive acceptance that it comes with the word. If you remember, we, Roy used to have a, a diagram. I need to start using some of these diagrams so we can see, see these, pro or at least visualize them. Um, so, and the other test to see if you were properly applying God's love was in your relationships around you, in your relationships around you. That was a clear, evident scripture that we looked at. How do those look like? Is there always something wrong? Are you always upset when you deal with these people? Are you always offended? Or, you know, are you always looking to get them back? Are you always kind of guarded in a defensive state when you're around them? I, I mean, I understand, you know, there, there's some people that you can't say anything outside that the weather is bad or they're going to get offended. We, we all know people like that, right? When you don't have the word, when you don't have a relationship like you do, 
there's not very much you can talk about before somebody gets offended, right? But that's not you. That, there's a love that we must plug in here, a relational aspect that this isn't all subjective and it's not all me. Remember, our direction is here first and then to that person. So the offensive aspect goes to zero or it should go to zero when we think about, OK, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing Remember, love is a sacrifice. As we'll, as we start to look into this love, you'll see every single aspect of this love takes somebody else into account. That's another part of this that is huge. It's not just about me. First of all, there's two things involved before me. It's God, number one. And then whoever else comes after that, there's two. We're third in the list when it comes to love. Yes, we have to do things to take care, to grow spiritually and even to have this love. Right. But the point of the love and your mission God has for you, the purpose that he has for you involves service. That's it. There, and there's a sacrifice involved, but there's a bigger reward involved in that in that service because you're on track. You're not only doing and growing and doing everything that God wants you to do. You realize the sacrifice and you enjoy doing it because you realize that it's made specifically for you. So that's a blessing in itself to know that God has designed these things that they can Yes, be a sacrifice, but the blessing is just so enormous on top of those that it, those things subside and you can not and have, you know, have happiness because of God's decision process around that. So that's a test um, other people, but you need to just question yourself sometimes on that, on on those relationships, because, you know, we can kind of exclude we, we get compartmentalized in our thinking and we exclude people, the, the ones we like or sort of like and like. Well, that should be the same across the board. I understand that people offend you. People don't even like you. That should not affect this love. It doesn't affect divine love. The question is, are we allowing it to affect how we express that love? And there shouldn't be a breakdown there. And I know I need to work on it. You need to work on it, too. It's a part of the Christian life that is not that doesn't come at the beginning like that. We know that this is a progressive thing. Love takes a lot of things and it will go through some of these. But I mean, when you think about love, you know, we have to include these exact qualities because there's an aspect of love that includes patience. You know, if it was just me on an island Patience, I'm not sure it would come into play that much. Maybe it would. Of, you know, when are you going to eat next? But we're referring to people. We're, we're talking about other people and patience. So love has so many aspects and patience. You see the sacrifice in that sometimes. When you wait on someone to do something or to, I don't know what it is. You name it. Everyone has something in their mind, right? But when you're waiting there must be a love that supports that waiting, because when you lose that love, you will lose the, the support and the patience as well. And that's where the breakdown starts to come in. That's the human creeping in back in the Holy Spirit being pushed aside, the divine love being pushed aside and, and see how that quickly becomes a problem. So. Um, and. If you are affecting other people in a negative way, uh, maybe we need to take a look at that, too. It's not just about whether we can appreciate them or whether we can be patient with them or tolerate them. It also is on the other side of that. Are we negatively affecting them when we are associating with them? Because that should be something that is non-existent when we're thinking about this love, because it takes into account, it doesn't push away. I mean, unless it's an enemy popping out of a foxhole. I'm not talking about that though. I'm referring to people, relationships, normal things that where you can talk and consider things. 
And that goes back to the, the great quality of love. You can remember it's meant part of the process is to build up, not to tear down in the relationships. It doesn't have to be head over heels, but it may be very something very small. Maybe something that you say that could be one sentence to encourage, to help, to promote, to inspire, to motivate somehow. See, there's a lot of things we can do to towards people and it may be just a physical presence. I, I don't know if you've experienced that just maybe being at a place to show someone, hey, you know, it's not all about um, separation, right? Try being in prison. You might want somebody to show up maybe every once in a while, every few months. There's some people in there that their family just stops showing up. Can you imagine? Just no more visits. They get tired of going in that, that place. It happens. So uh, if you are affecting other people, take note of that because this should not be happening. And this, this is divine love. It's not an attribute of it. Um, and that, that we saw that aspect in uh, 1 John 4, 20, in the fact that we can't be selective. We can't be selective. That was the piece about if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Remember that verse? So we can't be selective. And the verb hate here ranges from, in meaning from dislike all the way to hate. So it, it means to have a strong aversion to, to disregard or to disfavor. Um, so if we say we love God and yet have a mental hang up or some kind of bitterness with someone or there's, then how can we love God? That, that's essentially what this test is for us. We can't hold on to one thing, look at this scripture and still say we can have a love for God. There's got to be something's got to give right there. Because this, the, this verse is specifically pointing out to us that we can't have both. Can't love God, at least a, a love that this is referring to. Because remember, it's not based on the person, but on God. So, and let me just read these next two verses. We, we went through this, and it, I'll just read it. Ephesians 5.1, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And then verse two, we looked at the word imitators here and then it says, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So you notice there's there's a lot. There's already three instances of love. Technically, you're called beloved that has love in it. It's, it's a form of agape, beloved children. We've got the mandate, the command to walk here. And then we have also that Christ loved you. So let's look at what love looks like. First Corinthians 13, four, we're going to be here for a little bit, not too long, maybe a class and a half or two or something. But first Corinthians 13, four through seven. And I wanted to go through some of these aspects because this is describing love. It's just clearly telling us the details of what this love looks like. And when we think about this, we need to have a process in our mind that says, OK, this is God's love. At the same time, this is a love that I'm required to have. So it goes both ways. So the first part, love is patient. We just talked about that or mentioned it. Um, the word here is to be even tempered while enduring trying circumstances. And when you think about that, when you think about trying circumstances and other people, this can be many, 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 many things. This can be, I mean, it's, it's, there's a gamut of things going across the board. It's things that put pressure on the relationship. It's things that stress you out. It's things that you think about after the fact. It's things that we sometimes have a hard time moving on. And there may not be a relational problem there, but it's a trying circumstance on you as a person. It may not be affecting that relationship, but it is affecting you and it may be affecting them. So, um, 
But the point is that l this love can be patient to others, even in the midst of these trying circumstances. That's the that's a real patience. We think of patience, we think of patience as, OK, I'll do it until I can't do it anymore. That's not this patience. Because remember, you're going outside of yourself. You're not leaning on yourself anymore. You're, you're leaning essentially on God. Now, his timing, when his timing comes into play, that locks in your patience. You're no longer waiting on them to change. You're waiting on God's timing. And that's why we can be so patient when it comes to our love, because it's so nice to be able to lean on someone that you can love and, and have faith in that has it right back to you. It's not really about the trying circumstances. It's about what God is doing in that circumstance. He has that there for a purpose, for a reason. And we're just meant to take it in stride as a growing process. There's always a reason for it. Uh, we know that, right? Uh, even though we don't know it, we know that we can be patient. We can trust. We can lean on him in the, in the times that we're in and say, okay, God, you got this. That's patience. That's a patience. And this is kind of just sh showing that sponge effect that love has on any kind of trouble, problems, even sin. It's amazing that what it, what it can do, really, the love that God gives us that we can express. Um, and you can see here that... It has the ability to take on other people's problems and issues, even things uh, like we just talked about that are negatively directed towards you. There, the, we can't just say this applies to one area. When we say trying circumstances, this may be a direct missile to you that's meant to hurt you. Well, what about patience? Where is this going to play out? Where is it going to get you down the road by the way you acted versus with patience? There's a big, big difference where we uh, were we glorifying at that point. Were we representing at that point, God, or were we pushing away? Were we allowing ourselves to come through and the patience to go down? See, there's a completely opposite effect that we have when we think about human love versus what I can do and what I have in relation to what God and what he can do through his love. So the patience, it's strong. It's very, um, it, it, it doesn't, remember, it doesn't keep account because it relies on something more powerful. And this aspect is showing you that this love has the patience to tolerate in a way that relies on God. It's all it is. I like this word because it's one of the biblical words that it means patience, but it also can be translated perseverance. You know, when I think of love, you don't a lot, a lot of times you don't think about perseverance. You just think about at least when you, you know, when you first start, maybe in this, you think about good things in love. You think about it's going to work out. And it does work out, but you don't mostly think about positive things, but you don't necessarily think about persevering. But that's an aspect of this love. There's an aspect of you are taking on that persevering piece of the relationship and endurance. There's an endurance involved here. It reminds, it's kind of reminding me of faith. We're going back to that. Yes, that does come into play here. There's something that's not always that easy. It's not always the easiest road to take. It's not the path of least resistance like the world will tell you to take. No, there's a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice in that. And there's an aspect of patience and perseverance that comes into play. So and that's exactly what the enduring. Patient love that God has for us. Think about how patient he is for us. Can you imagine how bad it sometimes he's sitting there just not wanting us to go or to think or to make a certain decision when he's up there saying, I would uh, imagine how he feels. Yes, he's perfect. But you know what? He can also not desire things. And that could be a, 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 a patience for him just waiting on us to make a right decision. 
because that's where we're at. We just have, have decisions to make, right? 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So there's, there's the patience that we see towards us. But notice that He doesn't want to see anyone destroyed. He don't want to see anyone have discipline come to Him. He doesn't want to see anyone come to the sin unto death from rejection of Him. What does He want? A change of mind. That's it. He just wants a change of mind. That's all He wants. But He has that patience and He's waiting. He just waits on us. Because He, he created us in such a way that there's free will going around. You're not a robot. God desires things of you. But you have free will. And part of that free will means that not only do we have to make right decisions, but God has to be patient when we, he doesn't have to be, but he is, when we make wrong decisions. And that's what this is showing. The Lord is not slow as some count slowness. So maybe he's even slower than you count, for all we know. I mean, I, you know, we've all seen the example of an unbeliever that lives to almost 100 years old. Call that patience, waiting, and maybe they become a believer, maybe they don't. But the point is that God is giving them the ability to accept. That's patience, that's patience. And there's a lot more involved in that. You know, that person could be alive for someone else's purpose. Um, but they still have a free will decision to live life, to, to come to that point of reality. And there's people all the time that have lived up until they're, they're going to die and they come to that decision. And think about that. Their entire life was meant for that one decision. And that counts. That's the most important decision they can ever make because they just crossed the line and that's the one decision that they need. But think about how much meaning their life could have had if they would have made it so much earlier. It really doesn't matter, right? They're in heaven at that point. But you get the point. You're here. You've got time. So we're good. Back to 1 Corinthians 13.4. So just as the Lord is patient with us when it comes to turning away from sin and evil in our life or waiting on us to have faith in Him instead of leaning on our own understanding, um, he, he waits for us. And that's that love that we should have a desire to have, to wait for someone to come to a right or a better or a whatever decision that may help that relationship that takes patience as you well know when you're waiting on someone to do something to come to an understanding to grow spiritually to get to a point in your life where you can move forward it takes patience and it takes the word of god it takes leaning on god it takes the love of god in you because if it if it relies on you you can't do it you can't do it You'll give up or you'll bail out. And that's why it's so great. It's always there. Remember, I said that it's always available. So. And God only desires the best for us. He only desires the best for us. And that's your desire as well for other people. It should be only the best in your love and your patience you take that into account. You only want to see the best. You only want to see desire the best for them. And so what do you do? That, that sponge effect. See, the patience can take into account. It can rely on, certain, on God only. And you can take that and say, you know what? This is going to be a benefit to them. This exact patience and relying on God is going to benefit this situation because it will allow them time to get to a certain point where things may come back. We don't know, but God knows. And that's where that faith is bridged right there from the unknown to the known. I mean, you can apply this 
to anyone. You can apply it to anyone. Kids. Other family members. Maybe you have a hard time getting along with or other problems. Things just don't seem to really go smooth. Try having this patience. Try having this patience with them. Then it says love is kind. Love is kind. This word means gentle, friendly, considerate, or kind. And it means to show regard for others, to be thoughtful. In other words, do we take into account how others might feel when we make a decision? That's what this is referring to. Or do you just do it without any concern or thought of the fallout? Agape love, divine love, takes others into consideration. It thinks about the negative aspects of what may happen. It thinks about the repercussions, the fallout, the personalities of other people. It takes the circumstances into play. If you're going somewhere where there's a different culture, maybe completely different from what you know, this love will come in very handy because you won't go outside of your bounds because you're taking into account other people, other cultures. How do they feel? Maybe they're unbelievers. They don't need to hear you preaching to them at that moment. You're only going to turn them away. There's a love aspect that can exclude God, believe it or not. Who are you talking to? God can come out in you by the, your decisions, by your processes, without necessarily speaking the word to someone. There's a lot of people in this world, in this world that you can't even talk to them about God at all. You're going to push them away. They don't want to hear about quitting something that they're addicted to. Don't talk about that. You've been talking about that for how long with them? They want to hear something different. And if we can think about this love and approach it from a little bit different angle, it's a little bit different angle. See, you, the patience is coming in. You're not preaching to them. You're not telling them something they don't want to hear. You're taking into account where they are. Where are they at? Because they're not you. They don't think like you. They don't have probably this love that you have. They're not as advanced. So guess who has the responsibility? You do, not them. There's nothing required of them. More is required of you. Yes, there's some required of them. They have to take the repercussions of that, right? But we have the responsibility to do this. Love is kind. It takes into account. That's all I'm trying to say. It takes others into account. So when we make a decision like that, and this can even be in general, regular old conversation, think about them. Where are they at, right? What are they doing? What do they have going on? Because that conversation can, can go many ways. They, I mean, they might not have slept all night. Maybe they, they, they're, maybe they're hung over. Maybe they, you know, maybe they just got out of a, a bad relationship. Maybe they're really hurting down. Well, they're not going to tell you that. But if you know something about what's going on and you have insight into that, it can change the way you speak to somebody. That's kind to me. That's consider. That's gentle. That's a friendly and considerate in the way this word is talking about. And really, it goes back to being thoughtful. There's thoughtfulness here. That's how God is with us. He's thoughtful. Not only does he know everything about us, he knows our, our situation. But notice how gentle he is with us. He doesn't just throw us in the fire. He allows us to continue to grow, continue to do things in his plan. And he's patient. It's a, I don't know how he does it. But he does. And we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. Not on, our, not on our own, but with his help. Remember this. You should. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Selfishness here is the opposite of being kind. Since one takes... Uh, others into account. It's the opposite. It says, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. 
And here comes the command. Verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's the command. Have it. You know, what's funny is that this verse didn't necessarily, or these verses specifically, didn't necessarily mention love, but they're connected. They're very clearly connected. No doubt in my mind. This is the truth. This is the word of God. We have to make this a reality. Humility of mind, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. You know, we can make a lot of decisions that exclude others. And we don't think about the fallout many times after that, but a lot of times how that comes out is we see it, right? We're able to visualize these things. So all this is saying, see how it's saving you from something that may happen? It's saving you. It really is because you're taking it to account before it happens. It's that that kindness and the patience. And these these things all are combined. If you think, oh, gosh, this is getting too hard, overwhelming. No, it doesn't. It, it's that relational aspect that it all comes together. That's what God does. He molds you and he doesn't just give you one thing at a time. Sometimes these things come all together. This love, it's linked. Everything is in this love together. So some people, uh, you know, they're kind of shocked to find out that we aren't on this earth just for our own personal interest. Oh, my goodness. What? It's really not. I mean, I know that may be a, a bummer to some of you, but it's really not a bummer either. Think about what you're here for. Think about the broader picture. You're here for a purpose. God has a specific purpose for you. And it's got to have this love included with it. Because wherever you find yourself in ministry, I don't care, wherever you find yourself, this love is absolutely necessary. It's necessary. And, you know, it's, it's hard for folks sometimes to come to this because this is, a, even for myself, this is a growing process. This is a growing process. And we've got to mold ourselves and come to learn it because without it, your ministry will suffer. It will suffer. I have to take people into account. If I don't, I wouldn't have anything to say to you. I've got to do that. That's part of my job is to study and teach and take you into account. It's just part of the gift. I believe that God gives people that it comes with the territory. Now, it's my decision on how much time I take for each specific compartment. Every pastor is different in different areas. I understand that. Well, I choose to put most of my time into studying. Just what I choose to do. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. We'll find out. But I think it comes into play for your spiritual growth. So keep Keep remembering these things because your ministry is just as important as mine. We're all in ministry together. Technically, we're all in a body. We're all part of the body. We're all believers. What are you doing? Are you this little finger over here in your work in the corporate office? Well, that has function. It has meaning. You need to keep those joints flowing and moving. And if this love isn't a, a, in there... It's going to come out. It's going to come out in phone conversations. It's going to come out in your demeanor. It's going to come out in your text messages. It's going to come out in your emails. It's going to come out everywhere. It just comes out of you. you we got to have it. Then we go back to 1 Corinthians 13. And is not jealous. Not jealous. In other words, love does not include the fear of losing one's position in relationship to someone else. That's what this is referring to. It's not jealous. Or doesn't have resentment of someone else's achievements or fortune or any apprehension towards those things. There's a lot there. Isn't there? It's always amazing me, to me to see couples that, that are apparently head over heels for each other. But what ends up tearing them apart is jealousy. Tearing them apart. 
They are loving each other. They can't stay off of each other. But the jealousy just rips them apart. That's the problem of jealousy is it will rip you apart. It will push the relationship in opposite directions. And we've all experienced that. When you're young, you get a girlfriend, it's got, she's mine, you know? Like the caveman drag, you know, dragging his girlfriend with bat, batting everybody off. That's kind of part of the guy process, right? But we can't be like that when it comes to a relational aspect of a normal growing Christian. You have to trust. You have to trust. And it doesn't matter if you can trust the person or not. That's not the issue when it comes to jealousy. The issue is not relying on yourself to solve the problem of the distrust. You're relying on God. And that wipes out jealousy. It completely wipes it out. God will take care of the other end of the relationship. Let him do his job when it comes to justice and taking care of business as far as what may happen on that side. And it makes things a lot easier, a lot more comforting when you can just sit back and just love on them. You don't have to do anything. Be patient and love them. Let God take care of that end, right? That's, the good, that's a neat thing. That's what God gives us. We always tend to, <coughs> tend to take things in our own hands. And when you take things, you try to cover all the corners. You try to block all the numbers. You, you, you do the drive-bys, checking around who's coming to the house. You know what I mean? That's the human aspect of trying to cover all the ends there. And it's wrong. And it's not right. At its roots, it's just, it doesn't work. It'll drive you nuts. It'll drive her nuts. It'll drive everybody nuts. And then you're broke up. She'd rather go to see somebody that'll trust her. Of course, if you can't trust her anyway, she's going to have a hard time. But you get the point. You got to have somebody that you can, that, that loves you for who you are. And it's not even about us. It's about God. So that's a good stopping point. And on the second service, we'll continue a little bit of this love and then we'll get into our communion service. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can love you first and foremost. We know that um, every service is dedicated. It's dedicated to you and it's dedicated to your word. And we just ask that we can continue to grow, continue to experience this love that you have for us because you've shown it to us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It was brought to this earth and it was put on display for 33 years and sent to the cross to die for our sins. And we're so thankful for that, that we can even experience this agape love, the divine love that we have. Because through Christ, you gave us the option to be reconciled to him because we have sin in us, but yet we still can have a relationship with you. And you did that through Jesus Christ and you made it available as a free gift. You said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Nothing we have to do. We just have to believe you take care of the rest. You do the doing. And we thank you so much for doing working out the details in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.